Do you have the time to listen to me whine about nothing and everything all at once? I am one of those melodramatic fools, neurotic to the bone, no doubt about it. Sometimes I give myself the creeps. Sometimes my mind plays tricks on me. Oh, what you got there? Caffeine free diet coke. Oh, you, you got one of them? Yeah, I, love, yeah. I love a diet coke, okay. yeah. Caffeine free, does it taste drastically different? It tastes like a pistol, they're just, you know, just jacked up when you go to bed. I gave up coffee because I used to do a breakfast show. And I'd get into work at about 6 a.m. And by 10, by the time the show finished, I'd be on like my third cup, oh, yeah. just tweaking out. And it, you know, became a bit of a disgusting habit. It's, so not, it's not a good high. I switched for a herbal tea. Okay. Can we shut that door just yeah, to course. drown out the sound of your washing, washing machine? I should, have, I should have figured that out. I should have thought that through. Well, you're not an audio man, are you, Ian? So it's no, understandable. So we want me just like that? Yeah, mate. Okay. Wherever you're comfortable. Right. Um, so it kind of seems fitting that we're doing this at your house because it, we're obviously going to talk about Punk, your new book. But we have here a Green Day T-shirt on, and I, actually, I do. I see I? there the Green Day. Uh, is it silver disc, platinum uh, disc? It, it's actually neither silver nor platinum. For the benefit of the listeners, uh, I was sent this by Green Day's people or, or their record label Warner's, which is um, you don't really see these anymore because records not selling these kind of quantities. <laughs> but it's basically a, a, a like silver or platinum disc type uh i'm not describing it very well uh, it's a, the, 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 a frame cd a frame cd and it has a plaque in it and it says presented to, to ian, ian winwood Winwood, which is which is me uh to recognize sales in the united kingdom as kingdom of more than one million copies of the reprise album american idiot in 2004 above that i'm looking a bit like a stalker <laughs> yo yeah i didn't uh, even see that there's a uh, there's a framed picture of green day that was taken by my dear friend uh, and kerrang legend paul harry's that was taken two years ago uh, in Mannheim in germany and if you turn your head 90 degrees and look above there is a picture of it's like a shrine to pi- green day a picture yeah. of green day that was taken again by paul harry's that was actually before american idiot and that was taken in chicago and they're all sitting in a this is no good for for audio is it but they're all sitting in an equipment truck there basically uh and that was on the pop disaster tour so yeah the guitar he's holding there which is the guitar he has in the basket case video does he use that at every gig and he has he used it since the he 90s? Is, yeah i can actually tell you something a little bit about that for for anyone that doesn't know um the uh, can, can't picture it it's a it's a blue fernandez stratocaster copy and on it it has in red letters always uh, the initials BJ. Not blowjob, of course. N- no, for Billy Joe. His mum bought him that when he was nine years old. Nine, wow. And it, and it is called Blue. Right. Uh, he has named it Blue, and it has been played, in at least in part, for every single Green Day concert the band has ever played, and Sweet Children concert, which is what they were called before Green Day. Uh, and actually, the picture that you see on the wall, um, as they were just kind of changing shots, he actually gave it to me to hold. Uh, and so I'm holding this guitar and then Trey Cool, who's the band's drummer, picked up my phone and took a picture Love it. of me. And, I and quite, that's framed by the bedside table. I, I, quite, <laughs> I quite like this because I, I didn't ask to hold the guitar and I didn't ask for the photograph. It all happened around me. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite right. pleased with that. Um, so let's talk about yourself first of all, mate. Sure. So you're a long time music journalist. I have say it would appear so. What was the, the driving force behind uh, your choice to follow this career? Um, I'm not sure that I would call it a career. I've somehow <laughs> kept my head. Hey, you're still in the game. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I suppose that I suppose that I am. It was really nothing more complicated than the fact that um, I was okay at school, but I was I just had a natural affinity for for English and the written word, and I liked to write and I liked to read. And I, and I still do. Um, yeah, we've got a bookshelf full of books. We've got right a bookshelf. There. We've got bookshelves behind us full of books, some of which I've even read, a couple of which <laughs> I've written. Uh, and, um, and, you know, I've, I've been, as I look back on some of the things that I've been, you know, fortunate enough to do that, you know, the travel, um, these Green Day pictures that we were talking about, I was there when both of those were taken. So I've been lucky enough to travel, but the best part of the gig for me was always 
and and always is the writing it's it's my it, it's the bit that i like the best which is just as well because many of the bits that um were also perks of the job such as travel free music travel and parties i mean music's free for everybody now well, true, yeah. there, but me, me, you know music at uh, parties and travel and and yeah you know just sort of like a, a I guess a a thing of the past. Uh, yeah, but a, a certain grossness to it. St- a certain status that you were sort of not quite a member of the general public. Um, yeah, it would be the best way to describe it. I guess that doesn't sound because any of us sound very good. But you know, I'm on the guest list. It's yeah, a nice. Yeah. It, there's a certain thing when you go to the to the to the show and go, oh, I'm on the guest list, and 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 you always are. They they've always put you on, uh, and. Um, I still feel a bit cringe when I say that. Okay. When I get to venues still. Well, I, I mean, I suppose, I suppose, I remember actually once, um, it depends if I'm reviewing the show or not. If I'm reviewing the show, I'm actually, as ridiculous as that job of work is, I'm actually doing a job of yeah. work. Sometimes I just go to, uh, to, because I can see a band and, and I know who's putting on the show. And that's, you know, I suppose well, it is definitely a benefit of the job. It is worth pointing out that, that that I'm sure when the revolution comes, I will be up against the wall for, for all of these things that I'm saying. I am always aware that, that these this isn't free. People go, oh, I get to go to concerts for free. It's free for me. It's not free for the band. The band pays for that. So, And there are people out there who put their, get their names on guest lists and then don't show up. And the band then pays for that, that seat or, or that space in the venue and if um, the guest list is full that means that somebody who could have come there's, and would have come, yeah, there's, come. there's certainly that so if i'm on a list i do show up i'm i, I would like that to be taken into consideration before being sent it's on by, record before being sentenced by a jury <laughs> of my peers but yeah basically it was no more to go back to the, the, the question you asked me 25 minutes ago matt <laughs> uh I was a, a paper boy. Yeah, gosh, that makes me sound ill, doesn't it? And this magazine came into my paper bag one day called Kerrang! And I thought, oh my gosh, what's this? And it was like, well, this is... It was like the moment in um, in The Wizard of Oz where everything turns into colour. It was like, yeah, okay, yeah. this is... this is. And and, um, and my mum was very supportive. She, I said, I'd like to do this. And she said, well, you know, someone someone has to do it. I don't mean someone has to do it. Like, it's a tough job, yeah, but someone, someone's got some, to do Someone it. has to claw in <laughs> those chickens that are coming our way. Um, and, and, and so that's what I did. I, thought, I followed it up. Uh, I, 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 I was lucky that I spent my teenage years uh, somewhat in the southeast, in Buckinghamshire. So I, I had access to come to London to see shows. Because so, we can hear from your dolls at home you're yeah, a man of the I, north. Yeah, I'm, I'm a man of the north, but but my, my teenage years were actually spent in Buckingham. Um, and the only thing that, <laughs> that the rural setting for me has to recommend it, that one, is that it was within, to, not to, so far from touching distance, but you could get to London. It was feasible with a permissive mother uh, and a sense of daring do to get down to, I mean, we're doing this interview from Camden Town, which is where I live, but we're a, a, just a short, a short hop from the electric ballroom. And I remember coming to um, to Camden uh, from school, literally from school, to go and see the Bad Brains oh, on, wow. on, on my own, on my own. And I'd never heard them. I, I, just, I didn't even know that they were black. You know, this is, this is before the internet. You just didn't know this stuff. And... So enthused were people that I knew who had heard them. So I just came down. So I was aware that everything, certainly at the time, everything was in London um, and the magazines were in London and the, the shows that I went to were in London. So it was just a question of getting to London. So I came to London and um, and got my first writing gig. There is actually a story behind that that, that I read. Yeah, I'm sure everybody would like to know how you went about breaking into the industry. Well, I don't know. I don't know if you... Um, if if you look at something that you did as a as a, as a younger person, I mean you're you're a good example of this, Matt, because you're 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 quite, and I mean this is a compliment. You're quite the hustler, um, and and I'm not a very good hustler, but this is is sort of an exception to the rule. And I remember, uh, I was it was January, and I'd only been in London a matter of a, a week or so, if not only a day or so. And I remember reading in Kerrang that a a an American metal band called Exodus, who were it not for the fact that uh, Kirk Hammett, now of Metallica, was was in their ranks, 
uh, and the fact that their guitarist Gary Holt now deputizes uh, in Slayer, they would kind of be a footnote. They were a very influential early day thrash metal band, but they never really delivered on their promise. But it reported that they were they were in London recording their debut album. Uh, debut album. It wasn't nothing anything like their debut album. It was their fifth <laughs> album. Sorry, their latest uh, album. That, yeah, yeah uh, which which emerged under the name For- Force of Habit. And then they 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 um they revealed the name of the studio, which was Battery Studios, which is up in um up in f- suburban northwest London. And I found out where the studio was, and one it was just so cold. It was such a cold morning. <laughs> Dep- you remember it like it was yesterday. Departed, yeah? departed up to up to there, and um, at about half past nine, I, I, I went into the studio. And, and I explained who I was and to the reception, people at reception, and said, oh, I'm, I'm, liking, I'm hoping to get a, an interview to, to break into music journalism uh, with, these, with you know, the, the band. And very nicely... I, so when you say you explained who you were, you're essentially a kid trying his luck. A kid, a kid trying his luck, yeah. And, and they sent me away but said, the band aren't here yet, but, but come back. And I learned the most important lesson that I've, I've learned about the music industry, which is that people don't start work at half past nine in the morning. <laughs> no, <laughs> but I did. Michael Monroe does. Oh. He's the, he's the one exception. To oh, the rule. okay. You would think that Michael Monroe would be the last exception. to the I rule think back in the day would have been, but now he's obviously very clean, very sober. And I did a podcast with him at 9am oh, in okay. Kensington as well. So I had to get up at about seven oh, to get down God. there. From Birmingham, you had to come down. Uh, I came down the night before. All right, okay. But yeah, he was there, fresh as a daisy, like Michael Monroe, fully in, you know, the, the yeah. costume, the look, everything, yeah. ready to go. Right. But for the large part, nothing happens before nothing. midday, does it? So I came back a couple of hours later after having had a full English and by that point become extremely nervous. And there were uh, Gary Holt, the aforementioned Gary Holt, and the guitarist at the time, Rick Honnold, who comprised the H team, which for, for my money is the best guitar team in metal, I think that I've ever heard. Not certainly not the best songwriters, but the most effective guitar guitar team. I'll I'll stand by that. And this is a man that's written books on Metallica. Well, yeah, and and it, 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 I just they just play so well and so kind of searingly. And you have to remember as well, this is before again. I'm making myself sound old, but it, it, this needs sort of, I think, stressing that that I I'd never heard these people speak before. Now you know that there are all you sorts. Just go online. There are all sorts of there are, yeah, yeah. There are all sorts of YouTube channels. There are all sorts of means of communication that are making the the the, the craft of music journalism redundant uh, <laughs> for the most part. Um, but uh, the, you know, these were people. These were, I guess, rock stars to me. And it, it, that's perhaps not quite the the right word. But they were people on the other side of the screen on the other side of the magazine page on the other on, on the stage you know the, there was no sort of means direct means of communication between me and them the the means of communication was through music journalism then here i am suddenly with them uh, and it was quite a moment, and they, and they very kindly gave me an hour of their time in an interview, and I came... And that's a long time to give as well, even to a magazine, an hour's a long time, It, it, it? is a long time, and I wonder exactly what it was I was talking about, because I wouldn't take an hour now, um, <laughs> if only for the hell of the transcription. <laughs> yeah. And I came back, uh, I came back to where I was staying, and I had a little, t- <laughs> I had a little typewriter, and I typed up... Um, and I, I wrote an interview from it. I wrote a little feature from it. And then there were far more music magazines in the city. Then there was Metal Forces and Rock Power and, and a couple of others, Metal Hammer, Kerrang. And they were all print. They were all print. Yeah. And, and I found out where each of these magazines came from. And, uh, was, uh, Is that your cat? Their officers, yes. That's my cat outside of the front <laughs> door. Uh, of their officers. And I hand-delivered my little feature round to all of the... Uh, so did you scan and copy? Copy or did you have to type it up several times? I, no, I typed it on there. I think I had it. Um, I had it um, photocopied. Shall I let my cat in? Yeah, let's let. Him let's in. let him in. Don't want to disclude him. He wants to be part of the action. He's a big boy, isn't he? Yes, he's hot. He's a well-fed cat. So yes. Yeah, so for the purposes that now, I've let my just to, do. We are actually in my my flat in Camden. We have my cat. He is the noisiest cat in the world, by the way. Um, and that's what I did. And I got, I got offers for work from, for two, uh, two magazines. Uh, I took one of them, which was Metal Forces, which I took work on because it was a really strong underground metal mag. What I didn't know is that it was, it was going through its death throes 
at the time. So I wrote for them for a year. There were three issues published of a monthly magazine. I wrote a good couple of thousand pounds worth of work for which I got paid 70 pounds in the entire year. There's and no I, business like show business. And I just thought that this is how this is how magazines run. Uh, and I just and I just couldn't. I mean, I didn't know anyone in the industry. That's the thing. I wasn't anyone's friend. I wasn't a friend of anyone, and I hadn't. You I didn't w- have a connected father I had or no, mother. I had yeah. no connected. I was I was straight into it, and I just thought, how do people pay rent? How do people live or eat? How is this possible? That's still the question I ask myself every yeah, week. Yeah, <laughs> and 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 I guess I guess we've sort of we're sort of going back to that sort of chaotic model, but just on that magazine. So when I, I, I began to write for more established um, titles, uh, and it took me a number of years to get onto Kerrang! And, and the time before that, I would say, was my, were my apprenticeship years. But at least I was getting paid for it, and I was making a living for it from it. And as a, someone who loves the craft, you obviously, I presume, enjoyed the process of honing your craft. I, I did, and, and I don't think that I knew that I was honing it now. Um, I would... I think I would shudder to read anything that I'd written before I got to Kerrang. And even some of the stuff at, at Kerrang, I, I probably would have difficulty reading now. How um, many years have you been writing for the publication? Uh, for Kerrang, uh, 20 years. 20, 20, 20 years. 20, 19, but 20 next year. Wow. I know, uh, with, with, with a year off where I was poached by the enemy. Uh, and then I went back to Kerrang. That wasn't, it wasn't to my liking right really did you ever write for metal hammer have you ever written oh for yeah lots yeah. of times yeah um and in fact for a short time i was the, i was the features editor on metal hammer uh and metal hammer is a fine publication it was me that, that that was the problem there because i i'm just not really a metal head right so you know? punk is first and foremost your love is well, it within this yeah or, specific i mean and, genre and, and don't get me wrong I, you know there are metal bands that i love i love slayer uh, I love Motorhead, I love Metallica, but all of them sort of have that punk thing within them. Yeah. I, I'm really too much of a snob to really gumby down, <laughs> gumby down with the, the good old boys of metal. Uh, and so it was my problem. At, I'm the same, man. Yeah, it was my problem at the Hammer, you know, that, that, that it, was, it was an awkward fit. But yes, I was featured editor there for a year. Um, and it just really wasn't. I mean, I like for you know for anyone who doesn't know that the 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 term Kerrang, the name Kerrang, is an onomatopoeic word. It's for the it's, sound of a guitar. It's yeah? the sound of a guitar being struck with force. Kerrang. So in my time at Kerrang, I've written, I've I've interviewed loads of people, but a number of whom you would never ever describe as being metal. So the White Stripes, for example, these are the, the better known ones. Uh, the White Stripes, the Chili Peppers, Muse, the Beastie Boys. Uh, on a few What's o- been some of your favourites over the years? If you could co- handpick a couple, obviously on, you pretty much interviewed everyone. On I a presume, couple of occasions. Who but, stands but out? But not Maiden, being... oddly enough. Wow. Not Maiden, <laughs> never, interviewed, never interviewed Maiden, and I don't know why. Matt, I'd like to have Bruce on this uh, podcast. I think he'd be an interesting guest. He'd be fantastic. You could ask him why he voted Brexit yep. as, as, as the world. Tally ho, as, as, Yes, as the world. Yes, we, we won a war, don't you know? <laughs> Who's this we exactly, Bruce? Because I didn't. I'm pretty sure you weren't there. Um, I once got the Beastie Boys to dance for me. Amazing. Uh, it was in New York. and What it, album are they on at this uh, point? They were just releasing, uh, or just about to release, to the five boroughs. Great so record. Been, so they'd been away for five years. Um Open letter to NYC samples the Dead Boys, of that, course. Yeah, that's that's that's, that's, and that, that's a good that's a, that's a one of the better songs on the album. I think it it's perhaps a little bit stilted. Anyway, it doesn't really matter what I think of it. And we're in this brownstone uh, down in Chelsea in New York, and it was just me and them in this quite small little office, smaller than the room that we're in now, and. Um, and just to get things going, there was no way any of this was going to go into print. But just as a first question, I said, you know, you've been away for a long time. What have you been up to? And they said, oh, uh, we got kidnapped by Sasquatch. Sasquatch, <laughs> I, I, I learned, is what we call Bigfoot. Yeah. And I said, OK, really? And they said, yeah. And I said, I, I said oh, how was that? And they said, oh, it was OK. They t- he taught us loads of stuff, loads of things. Uh, and I said, well, such as what? And, and they said, oh, he, he taught us how to dance. And um, 
and I said, show me. Okay, show me. Now, not only two of the three did it. Horowitz, who is my favourite Beastie Boy, didn't stand up. But Adam Yauch and Mike Diamond got up and just started dancing as they do in a Beastie Boys video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like intergalactic, like intergalactic style. Yeah, exactly like intergalactic. Like, yeah. And they're going... <laughs> and I'm sat there in this wood-lined little, tiny little office thinking, the Beastie Boys are dancing for me. And it's important to say that um, there are so many things musically that I've been on the wrong <laughs> wrong side of uh, and so many things that I didn't recognise as being great until it was too late. Um, I'm really not a very good bellwether at all, but I did get it right. You've got two cats? I've got two cats. This wow. is Durf Scratch who's coming in. Durf Scratch, is yeah. that his name? <laughs> and the other, one, the other one's Chuck Wagon. But I, but I did buy Paul's Boutique on the day it came out and I recognised it at the time as being a significant work of genius. Even the hip-hop guys at that time were, I think, taken aback by the level of sampling and artistry in that album. Just, yeah. Th- th- that it, it, I mean, it's just, for anyone... I mean, it's difficult now, of course. I, I actually played it for my, my girlfriend who'd, who'd never heard it before. It doesn't sound as revolutionary as it did at the time, but at the time, it's a record made up entirely of other records yep. and then sampling and then rapping over the top. But as a means of escaping from the, excuse me, from the corner into which they painted themselves on license. That to kind help. of frat rock. Yeah. You know, they sold, what, in the state, 7 million copies. So maybe, what, 12 million copies throughout the world of that bratish. They, they, they could not have been less credible as a group in the eyes of serious music yeah. people. And, he, and the imagery was a big part of that, wasn't it? With the big V-dub badge yeah. chains. And it was all... I mean, it was a, it's still a great record, I think. But yeah, it certainly <laughs> did pigeonhole them. Very much so. Yeah. And, and that it had one hit wonder written all over it. And, and here they come. Here they come back with Paul's Boutique. And it's suddenly... I mean, it died on its, on its derriere. No doubt. At the time. Yeah. I mean, I think it went gold in the States. But that's not what Capitol Records were looking for. Their new home. And they were able to regroup and then return with license. Uh, check Ill your commu- head. Check your head. With check it. your head, and then ill then communication. communication. Um, what a run! Yeah, it really was. But so I sort of got that right. So to, to be in a room and you just think, well, the beast, <laughs> the Beastie Boys are dancing for me. That's that's quite cool. But you, you know, they're, they're right. the moments that you cherish. Do you cherish those moments and yeah, realize I, that you're privileged to be in that position? And yes, I, I do. Pinch yourself almost. I do. Although I think that the actually, I know you're not someone who gets starstruck or not not particularly. Um, and um, I, and I don't want to be friends with them either. That's never really been of interest to me. Again, going back to that thing of you're there to do your job, which is to document, review. Yeah, and, for, and... for what you know, for what it's worth, and this sounds very pompous, but I'll, I'll stand by it. My, my responsibility is to the is to whoever's reading the piece. And given that I don't know who's reading the piece, it's me who's reading it. Once I've written it, my responsibility is to myself. I don't. I'm not. I'm not being paid by the bands. I'm not their PR. I'm not there to be on their side. Has that got you in trouble over the years? Yeah, quite a few times. Um, uh, interestingly, one person with whom, one of the people with whom I am friends is is, is Frank Turner, which your listeners may know as a... As he's a, been as on a, the show. Yeah, he's coming on again soon. I'm, oh, actually, it, I'm going to record a chat with him in Waterstones in Birmingham when you're on the tour with oh, him. Oh, yeah, okay. So I'll see you then. Well, uh, yes, I'm... Oh, that will You're be lovely, hosting then. them all. I am indeed. I'm going. I'm. I'm. I'm his interrogator on a tour we're doing next week. Because he did the um, the book Q and A for you. Didn't he, he did at, at Rough Trade. Yeah. yeah. And um, and he. Uh, I remember giving a really cool review to uh, his album Tape Deck Heart, which actually is. I was wrong about it. I was a bit, and taking real pleasure in in sort of being damning with faint praise about it. Because it, it sort of said to me, oh, well, uh, the fact that, w- that that I'm on good terms with him isn't colouring what I'm writing. Um, did it affect the friendship at all? or did n- he... It, he never mentioned it, <laughs> which is, I think, one of the reasons why we're friends. It yeah. actually took me to mention it a couple of years later. But a couple of people sort of around him were said at the time, oh, you know, we thought we thought you were our friend. Yeah. And it's like, well, I, I am, but that doesn't that doesn't give you carte blanche for for, for me. You're you not know. above criticism. No, really. And, and I feel even I feel uncomfortable even saying all of this because as if as if somehow you know my own integrity matters, but it, it matters to, to me. You. Yeah, and and also it matters that 
Well, good on you, man, because well, that's a to, rare thing in today's well, to, to journalistic the, world, to the, I think. Well, to, to the best of my ability, I'm, I at least try to be an honest broker. Uh, and, um, you know, you look back at, at magazines <laughs> over, over the years and you see great reviews for bands, you know, Maiden, for example. Maiden released some terrible albums um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the 90s and even some of them in the 80s. And they're 5Ks, 5Ks, 5Ks in Kerrang! Because it was all sort of this drinking... Because they want them to still be and, the and cover yeah, stars and as it well. Was, and it was all sort of this drinking club as well. Yeah, it yeah, was yeah. All sort of, it was a bit corrupt. Um, and I, 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 I try, to the best of my ability, I try to stay out of that. If, if, and if that... It, it matters to me at least. That segues nicely into the book then, because okay. the, the opening foreword is from Frank. It says the only thing that punk rock should ever really mean is not sitting around and waiting for the lights to go green. That's right. Off Try This at Home. Um, and then the book itself is a book about the 90s explosion of punk rock. Um, I wonder if we could talk about what that scene uh, and style of music means to you from a personal point of view. And then going into the book, uh, why you s- chose this specific time period to explore. Yeah, I I, I think... I think um... I think that I, re- I, I, I picked this time period um, because, uh, I mean, the book's called Smash, uh, which t- Smash with an exclamation mark, and, and, it, and it takes its title sort of from the Offspring album Smash without an exclamation mark that was released uh, in April of 1994, um, and which along with Green Day's Dookie album... Um, broke the glass ceiling that separated punk rock from the mainstream. Uh, and I, and when I say punk rock, I mean bands that identified as punk rock. Not Nirvana, not Soundgarden, not Pearl Jam, not Alice in Chains, not Smashing Pumpkins, although a, a punk rock spirit... Uh, Pervades through all of those. All definitely. of those, and it would, and only an idiot. But they don't... They, and they, the success of those bands was arguably as well, I guess, what paved the way, right, for the success of yes, yes, it, Green Day, yes, Offspring, etc. It, et it did, but, I, you know, I'm old enough to remember the sort of frenzy um, of, of uh, adoration and opprobrium that, that the music press bestowed on... The, the bands from from the Pacific Northwest and, and continue to do uh, yeah but but Nirvana were the good guys I mean it really was sort of like they were, they hounded Kurt Cobain in the way that the the mainstream media hounded Princess Diana really yeah. I mean it really was quite something to see um, <clears throat> every week Nirvana on the cover of Sounds the Melody Maker the Enemy which were selling three hundred thousand copies a week this is this is mind-boggling figures today really they are nothing selling anything like that <laughs> uh and then and then and you know nirvana with the good guys and pearl jam with the bad guys and how how ridiculous does that now seem well there's that interesting scene in is it 10 the documentary yeah and they're sort of saying how actually the people around nirvana were the gross kind of corporate yeah and pearl jam were actually quite punk rock in their approach and in their attitude yeah and- i mean Kurt pearl jam didn't make any videos after 10 um yeah, and, and and anyway, and and it was such a frenzy that by the time it ended, in and it ended with with Kurt Cobain's suicide in 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 April of nineteen ninety four, the press had, had had exhausted itself, you know, lobbing around superlatives, and so the attention played to paid to Green Day and the Offspring, and bands who were define who defined themselves as punk rock bands and who had been doing this thing uh touring in vans and and you know just doing ha- the black flag way yeah, yeah just having this self-sufficient scene its own record labels uh lookout records up in the bay area epitaph records down in uh, in the san fernando valley in la and, and orange county um sort of even when they went supernova and were selling millions and millions of copies, the offspring were still kind of a, a part-time band, you know, and they did virtually no press. Green Day did very little press. I mean, Green Day did a lot of videos and were on MTV a lot, and the offspring were on MTV a lot. But not much changed other than everything else around them. They were just sort of like, and and they retained to me this feeling that they were underdogs 
Uh, Proudly so as well. Y- yeah. And, and I just thought and I still think that much of the music about which I'm writing in the book, so whether it be social distortion, whether it be bad religion, no effects, rancid, Green Day, uh, all of those bands, perhaps with the exception of Green Day, because, of course, American Idiot did give them their due. But that was 10 years after, after uh, 10 to 15 years after the period about which I'm writing in the book. Um, I just thought this was sort of a story for, of, of underdogs and that hadn't quite been given its moment in the sun. Yeah, it's not um, been told in this level of detail no, or depth before, certainly. No, and that was why, and I just thought, I think, I've, I, think I can get a story out of this. And um, <laughs> it is with my tongue in my cheek but nonetheless, it's possibly fair to say that I might just qualify as a punk rock insider in the fact that I've interviewed all of the bands numerous times. Incl- Rancid were the only group that didn't come out and play, if you'll excuse the pun. <laughs> uh, and, but, but I've even interviewed Rancid a number of times. Do they just not do it? They just, they not just don't do anything now? anymore. And I used all sorts of little avenues. I didn't just go to their, their manager yeah, or anything. Yeah. And actually, funnily enough, that I, I actually did meet their manager. Um, after, uh, Who's that, Dan Hodge? Uh, he's, he manages, yeah, Dan, he yeah, manages yeah. the Interrupters. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. at an Interrupters show at the Electric Ballroom here in Camden. And, um, and he was really nice. And I thought, you know what? If I had met you... I possibly might have been able to, you might have been able to make an appeal on my behalf. But I tried all sorts of routes. As I do with this podcast, I know the yeah. the so, ways around things to try and get that's right. the access. And, 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 usually, and usually it works. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Or usually, but, but I mean, I, I, I couldn't, it was as if they were dead, <laughs> Matt. But everyone else... They assumedly um, approved of their inclusion in the book, though. They didn't I, want to I, not be involved. I have no idea. Oh, you just went no, ahead anyway. I, I love yeah, it. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. That I mean, that wouldn't make any difference. To, <laughs> I mean, if they said we don't want to be in it, that wouldn't have made any difference to me. It's I love not, it. It's not their business to tell me what I can and can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Punk um, but I was able to get everyone else. Uh, and again, given that I'm saying a few pompous things on this, on this interview... Uh, I wanted to write a book that was sort of like a big New Yorker article, really, about about a seemingly slight subject that which wasn't isn't slight to me. Um, th- you know, about this this collection of misfits who somehow ended up in the top ten. Um, all of the bands that featured ended up at least with gold albums in the United States, which for anyone who doesn't know is, is albums that sell more than half a million copies. Um, and none of them seemed particularly to be looking for it, you know? Um, many of them did it on independent labels, and I just thought it was a, a cool little story to tell. So, so you know, that's what I did, and I sat set, I set down to it uh, over the winter of, of 2017, 2018, uh, and into the spring and summer with rewrites and edits and tightening up and whatnot. It's quite a lot of work goes into a book. Uh, and and I, and I, it's coming. It's just come out, and I'm I am particularly proud of it. It's a great book, mate, yeah, and it's really you. nice to see this subject being given its due by somebody who's so well informed and clearly passionate about it. And Quite thank you. The way you talk about certain songs, I've never heard. You know, the music of say the Offspring or No Effects be evaluated in the way that you get into in this book as well, which is really refreshing. Okay, well, I, I mean that that was it was a straight. Well, thank you, thank you for that, Matt. It was a strange thing to do because. Um, the social commentary, for instance, if you could lead into that as well, in, in The Offspring's music. Yeah. Which the, many people, I'm sure, would have never thought about or taken the time to appreciate. No, and, and, it's, and it's strange as well. I mean, music really is, popular music particularly, really is a, uh, an amazing Trojan horse um, for sneaking in things of substance. But it's such a good Trojan horse that if the song's too catchy, it's possible to go years, decades, or even forever without really considering what the song's about. Elvis Costello's Oliver's Army is the, the, a peach of a pop song uh, that features references to Palestine and Johannesburg and, and Winston Churchill. And you you could just happily sing along without noticing that. And, and the, the N-word. And the N-word yeah. as well, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. And he he refused to take that out for release in the United States. What All it takes one H-E trigger, one more widow, one less white nigger is the line. Um, yeah, but there you go, singing along to the song. Um, and similarly with The Offspring's... Um, 
uh, come out and play, keep them separated. Which is, I think, an incredibly sophisticated song. And it was written by Dexter Holland, who was at, um, at university at USC, University of Southern California, uh, on a campus that was... To, in order to get to the campus, he had to drive through uh, Compton and Watts, uh, which certainly at the time in the early 90s were, were not We're good. talking the age of gangster rap. We're talking the age yeah. of gangster rap. We're talking the age of the LA riots. Yep. To Bloods and Crips. Bloods and Crips. You know, these were dangerous neighborhoods. And he wrote a, a song about the cheapness of life uh, in neighborhoods such as that. But what I, what I found particularly striking is that he... He, he he harvested the material of, 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 of for the for the lyric simply by driving through these neighborhoods in his crappy car um and um and uh, a white college kid with dreadlocks like. yeah and but, but who wasn't who a car so crappy that no one paid him any mind and that's sort of the perceptive perspective of the song it is it is a, a, a it is at a journalistic distance observation yeah. yeah and i thought that was very good he's not he's not bemoaning he's not taking a, a, the stage center stage in a story in which he does not himself belong and i thought that was quite i thought while listening i'm not sure i thought it at the time i'm not sure i noticed it at the time i knew what the song was about but as i sort of listened to it to to articulate what it was I liked about it, that was the thing. This tasteful distance, you know, it's not its not up in the faces or in the lives of people whose lives he doesn't recognise. Um, and I thought that that was, was very clever. What the listener hears, uh, and I don't think the song is lessened if, if the, the impact of the song uh, or the appreciation of the song is any less if one doesn't consider that angle. It's just a fantastic caffeinated pop song. with its eastern flavor yeah and yeah it's, it's very unusual it, yeah it? it's slightly egyptian yeah. almost almost guitar motif uh and they did wrote this and and brett gurevitz at epitaph hired for the first time ever a radio plugger and he played this radio plugger sixty thousand dollars and then suddenly it's it's on k-rock which is being played on k-rock um which is the leading alternative rock radio station in l.a and thus, by extension, America. And also, it's picked up by MTV, who are showing a video that cost $5,000 to film in a friend's garage, or yeah, garage, yeah, as yeah. they would say. The majority, the heft of the budget was spent on um, food for the barbecue and beer for the barbecue afterwards. And yet, suddenly, there they are. Uh, and obviously, that then led to that album becoming the first independent album in history, right? Yeah, the first independent, and it remains, it was the most successful independent album of all time. That has since been usurped by Adele. Oh, has it? Uh, right. Yeah, and other people too. It remains the best-selling rock release. And it was the first to tip the million sales point. Oh, yeah, and, and, and you know, it was doing, you know, 100,000 copies a week. It's worth, worth bearing in mind that Epitaph before that point had only sold 100,000 copies of any one artist, and that was Bad Religion, um, who were there before The Offspring, their, their commercial gold standard. The label would have uh, ice cream cake parties for any band that sold 50,000 copies. The label's owner, Brett Gurevitz, who also plays in Bad Religion, defined that as punk rock gold. Yeah. If a punk rock album sells 50,000 copies, that is the, the highest achievement. That is the equivalent of, uh, I don't know, Bush, for example, or any other band uh, around that time uh, selling 500,000 albums. So that would, they'd have, although you, you wouldn't get a gold disc for 50,000 albums, you would get an ice cream cake party and all the other bands would come along. And the reason that they did that is because it was just beyond his imagination or comprehension that, that, any act on his label would would actually sell proper gold, and yet suddenly here they were now shifting in in the millions of of sales, and they, he stayed independent. So and it, that's what I love about it is obviously he got caught in. How much did he get offered? Millions, right? He, he, at Sony Sony Records or the Sony Corporation offered him fifty five zero. And bear in mind this is nineteen ninety four as well. Five zero million dollars for a, a minority stake in the company. Oh wow! For, so not even the whole thing. No, forty nine percent. And it's also worth noting that he was on taking crack and heroin and cocaine and anything else he could get his hand on his hands on at the time. Um, 
And he had the good sense to turn this down. So because of his sense of pride and achievement, and, and I think that was part integrity. Of it. And I think I think that was part of it. I think you know from what I can infer, from what I can deduce, that was part of it. Largely, significantly as well, just a sense of opposition that he didn't perhaps want to be in any club that would have him as a member. The, the majors had ignored the the entire scene for for. Certainly a good five years, you know. Um, they were very late to the party. It wasn't like the Pacific Northwest where they, they got involved quickly and smartly. They, they were very late to the party. They were remiss. Um, and he thought, well, I've get, I've done, we've done okay without them. Let's see how far we can... We'll ride this thing until the wheels fall, f- f- fall off. Um, and I just don't think he needed them, really. And there were people around the Which offering. is an achievement as well, isn't it? Because you talk in the book about how they actually kept up with this, you know, surge in sales. Yeah, and- <laughs> I, just, I mean, just, just the practicalities, Matt, of what uh, 100,000 cds and albums looks like you know where 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 do you where do you put those <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah you know so they were they were hiring warehouse spaces all over the city uh guarding pallets just the you know the sheer mechanics of those kind of numbers because they didn't have that you know major labels have warehouses in which to store and uh, a staff to obviously phys- yeah phys- physical and, and and a distribution system it's a well-oiled machine selling you know for I don't know what ninety four. What else is big in ninety four? That was so. You know, Green Day on 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 a major on Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers have the facilities to sell. You know that many albums. They have it with for the uh, on all major labels too. Whether it be the Smashing Pumpkins, whether it be Michael Jackson, whether it be uh, Mariah Carey. You know, whoever's selling Hootie and the Blowfish, they they have. They have the space, and, and Indy doesn't do that. And Indy's Indy's just in time supply. Yeah, and um, and yet there they were, and they and they, you know, they they they, they duked it out with the big boys, and they and they and they held their own. Um, let's talk about no effects, and obviously Fat Mike and his role in Epitaph, but then obviously I guess inspired by the model and by Brett's ethos towards making and releasing music yeah. he then set up his own independent label called fat records from speaking to both of them did you feel like there was a fallout at any point um i mean because the, of that the the idea of um a, a, a punk rock record label isn't new and it, it it didn't start with epitaph um where would you say it did start with Discord? Uh, or even before then? Before then. Uh, well, I guess in the UK anyway, Buzzcocks. Wasn't well, it? the Buzzcocks released yeah. Spiral Scratch. That was the Scout Scratch EP in 78? I think 77. 77. Yeah, and it was um, so the that, first indie so, label yeah, in the so UK, that, wasn't it? That was the first, they were the first ones to do it. But, but yeah, you're right. There was Discord in, in Washington, D.C. There was SST uh, in down in Los Angeles, Black Flag. Guitarist Greg Ginn established that. Um, Solid State Transmitters, I think SST stands oh, is for. That? I never I, even. I think so. Knew that, yeah. uh, up in uh, San Francisco, you had, of course, Alternative Tentacles, which was uh, the label Jello, founded right? by Jello by Biafra uh, and the Dead Kennedys. So, so this wasn't new. I mean, in so much as there has been a fallout between Fat Mike and <coughs> and Brett Gorovitz, Brett's utterly mystified by what it might be fat mike seems to think and it's really nothing more than this and there are a couple of beefs in the book there's a beef between the offspring and epitaph and the offspring leaving epitaph to go to a major and there's the fat mike appears disgruntled that mr brett didn't support the foundation of 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 um fat mike's record label fat records fat rec chords uh is how it's written down but with all of the little minor flare-ups that, that, that I write about in the book, in hindsight, no one can really seem to remember what they were about. And and Fat Mike's sort of uh, displeasure came from an interview that he'd read a couple of days previous to, to me talking to him. Right, okay. And it was I, fresh. Yeah, and I'm not sure that he would have brought that up. I mean, he, and, and he is generous enough to say that, that Mr. Brett is the... 
the best that he thinks Mr. Brett is the best writer in punk rock, the best songwriter in punk rock, and he might be onto something there. I heard Tim Armstrong on Toby Morse from H2O's podcast very recently, um, and he was saying that he regards Brett as the best producer in punk rock as well. Okay, right. He's done every rancid album ever, right? Uh, Apart no, from the he, first. Uh, he no, he hasn't. He he didn't do an Outcome the Wolves. Did he not do an uh, Outcome the Wolves? No, he didn't. Um, I stand corrected. It will come, Jerry that's Finn. That's the best one. Oh yeah, Jerry yeah, yeah. Finn. That was his first album, yeah, right? It was. Yeah. yeah, Jerry Finn, who who mixed Dookie. He did do some of the work on Out, Out Come the Wolves, uncredited, uh, but because there was a studio clash, uh, right, right. A, a schedule clash, yeah, yeah, and yeah. the sessions overran. Um, but he he's certainly been their guy, very the much whole so. time. Yeah, right? very much so. Uh, and so I I don't think I mean Mr. Brett did point out that. Fat Mike is possibly the only person in punk rock who has taken more drugs than he has. <laughs> uh, so how reliable Fat Mike's Fat Mike's memory is is possibly open open to open to question. Um, it's nothing. And um, let's talk about the role of Rob Cavallo. Yeah, I mean Rob Cav- Rob Cavallo. It is it, it is the strangest thing. Just how. So on 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 tiny incidents, you know, matters of great significance hinge. Um, the reason that Smash the album sounds so good is because Dexter Holland insisted that the band buy better equipment. They were able to do so because they came back from an America from a European tour with no effects with seven hundred and fifty dollars. Without that, how would the album have sounded? Probably not that good. Would it have sold any copies? Probably not. Um, Rob Cavallo was a young A&R representative of Warner Brothers Records as well as a producer for the label. He was in the studio in Los Angeles producing his first, the first album he's ever produced, uh, which is a self-titled album by LA's very much... One of the best, most underrated punk bands yeah, ever. Yeah, one, one of the very, very best and, and very, very much pop. Yeah, yeah. Pop punk. Uh, Ramones-esque, isn't it? Ramones-esque, the, uh, the Muffs. And... Um, and the Muffs were managed by uh, a, a, a two men who had just taken on Green Day. They had a demo tape. They put it in Rob Cavallo's pocket or on the mixing desk and said, you know, listen to this, you might like it. And it was only out of a sense of duty. No, see, he certainly didn't want to. It was in the wee, wee hours of the morning. He's driving back from uh, the Music Grinder studio in Los Angeles. Uh, and he's going to, and he's driving home. And he puts this tape in and it's got some of the songs that would make up Dookie. Uh, and he's just so captured by what he hears. I think Longview was on there. I think Basket Case was on there. Uh, maybe even When I Come Around. Maybe the big the big hit singles, Burnout, I think, was on there. Uh, and from that, he, he, he lobbied hard from a very lowly position. And this needs remembering as well that the idea of uh, the idea that an A and R man, a twenty something A and R man, would go to a major record label, record labels of deeply hierarchical structures, uh, very low down on the totem pole, would go to his superiors and say, "I want to sign a punk rock band." Um, that doesn't. That's not. That doesn't suggest a man whose finger is on the pulse at all. And the turnover in these companies, certainly at the time, was very, very quick. You know, um, and. Yet he went to bat for this band and they say he signed he signed Green Day and they liked him. And, you know, to cut a long story short, he's he's um, he's produced. You could say all the all the Green Day albums of no, he didn't produce 21st Century Breakdown, which I think is a criminally underrated album. But he produced Dookie, he produced Insomniac, he produced Nimrod, uh, he produced American Idiot. Yeah. Uh, and what's more, he's just the most amazingly stand-up guy you could ever meet. He could he could not have been more helpful to me uh, in the book. Uh, and Did he later on go on to do the massive My Chemical Romance album, The Black Parade? He did The Black Parade, yeah, which wasn't quite as massive as you think it is. Was it not? A few million albums, but nothing like, nothing like American Idiot right, right. or anything like that. American Idiot was the last great blockbusting rock album. Um, but interestingly, <coughs> excuse me, Kerrang! Uh, as, as a cover, 
uh, ran as a cover story, the, the, the story of Dookie, which I, which I wrote. This is at the start of February. Because it's obviously 25 years 25 as well, so it's perfectly years. timed. Amazing, book, isn't it? yeah, 20, 25 years. I mean, where does the time go? And they wanted clearance of, on a photograph that, that Rob, on which Rob holds the copyright. So I sent him a text saying, oh, hi, Rob, is there any chance we could use this photo? And he went, yeah, yeah, of course you can. Uh, I'm just on my way to Atlanta. I'm doing the sound for the Super Bowl halftime show. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> Big boy business. It, well, yeah, this is, you know, this, yes, this is right. This is not the minor leagues. Uh, so it worked out for him as well. Also, he didn't, he didn't, um, he didn't charge a fee for producing Dookie. He got points because he wanted to keep the recording caps down, which is one of the smartest decisions uh, anyone's ever made because it, you know, sold, what, 15, 17 million copies, and he got a cut of every single one of those. So, yeah, it was wise. Uh, I'd love to talk to you all day, mate. I know on the subject of punk, you have an article to write I am, on I am three the qu- godfather of punk himself. I, I, am, I, am, three, I am three quarters <laughs> away. And just, just to set the scene for the listener... Uh, do you call them listeners on podcast audience? Yeah, they're listeners. They're disciples. listening. Hopefully, they're listening. Disciples. Disciples. <laughs> we can dream. Uh, um, Matt, Matt came to the door. This has been on the docket for some time. And Matt came to the door, and I really was just hammering away at, at my keyboard. Um, I, yes, I have a looming deadline um, about John Lydon, uh, with whom you and I have both had encounters. Yes. Yours was good. Mine I've, was I've, fantastic. I've had two. The first one was horrible, <laughs> and the second one was. He was a sweetheart, and I'm not sure which put me on edge the most. Because you did an interview, right? And the first one was basically unusable, was it? So you arranged just, another one. He was, he was like, I mean, if you if you encountered someone in the street carrying on like that, you'd ring the authorities. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. He was like a, a mad pensioner, <laughs> uh, which is kind of what he is now. Yeah, and and I, I still I rate him very high. I know you do, <laughs> uh, so, but but the, my brief has been uh, Johnny Rotten Punk. Punk or not. It would have been good to have been in that room. Well, so if anybody hasn't seen this, there was a live yeah. Q&A in LA a couple of days ago, and it was Henry Rollins, Duff McKagan, uh, Danita from L7, yeah. Marky Ramone, and John Lydon, and John Valvotos, because it's to celebrate this new punk documentary yeah, right. that him and Iggy have made. And it's basically Marky Ramone and John just going loggerheads, isn't it? Just yeah. going at it. Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> and Rollins and Duff just kind of look bemused, don't they? they <laughs> have do. you seen all the videos? Yeah, I have, yeah. <laughs> and And... and of course he's still punk. And the reason he's still punk is because if you just take the art, if you just take him out of it, what remains is the music. What is, what is Marky Ramon? And if you do the same with Marky Ramon, what is Marky Ramon doing? He's taking around a, a, a facsimile of Ramon's songs, many of which he didn't even play on, at clubs like the Underworld uh, here in Camden. And it's nice if you want it, but it's not. It's not. It's no. It ain't revolutionary. It's nothing. It's no different from you know, uh, the bands from the seventies playing weekenders at Butlins, which my mum goes to, and she loves it. And there's nothing wrong with that. But let's not pretend it's anything of particularly revolutionary significance. And of course, the Ramones definitely had a key role in the English punk scene, and totally. a lot of bands seeing them, like the Clash, Pistols, uh, the Roundhouse, and being inspired yeah. to start their own music. Totally, but as you say, he wasn't on those first four albums. No, he it? wasn't. And, and, and it's, it's although what, he was in the Richard Helen Voidoids, which he, is, is clear to point out in the video. Yes, he was in Richard. <laughs> but it, but you know, Pill have put out two, I think two albums, certainly two albums in the last few years, both of which are flat out cutting edge weird yeah. you know there is a beating punk heart if you want to call it that uh an oppositional creative heart still beating within Leiden for all of the rubbish that he talks when people stick microphones in front of his face if you listen to the body of work i'll go to bat for that any day Amen. Yeah. Um, let, can we end on the Nickelback story? Chad Kroger, can we entertain our listeners with the, uh, the yeah, tale of yeah, when okay. you and Chad almost had a boxing match? Yeah, I was, I was, <laughs> I, I, I'll do, I'll do this quite quickly because I've, I've, I, I have told it before, but my reputation such as it is, my name, I suppose, was made by an article that I wrote about Nickelback after an interview in Philadelphia that had gone particularly poorly, um, where questions that I thought were only mildly, um, not even confrontational, probing about the fact that Nickelback are, 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 are quite a, a reactionary music force and, and quite just not very good, really. <laughs> uh, and, but the thing is, if you ask, if you ask artists <coughs> that, 
sometimes they, in fact, most times they quite like being challenged and quite like defending themselves. So it's it's uh, difficult questions often make for easier interviews. It goes back to what you were saying at the start as well about wanting to do the feature justice and you know for a fact that your readers are interested in yeah. what he sees as the musical worth of his band Nickelback. That, that's right. And so the interview goes incredibly badly. Um, <laughs> they, the, the band are... Th- this took place in Philadelphia and the band are performing at a, at a charity concert, a radio station Christmas charity concert. Uh, on a five-band bill, of which they are fourth bottom to the bill. So they're only second on. Above them are uh, some 41, Bush, and then uh, Blink-182. So not even good bands above them. No, not particularly. <laughs> uh, and... Um, and they put, you know, it was at the at what is now, I think, called the Wells Fargo Arena. It's where the Philadelphia 76ers and the Flyers hockey te- ice hockey team play. Um, so it's a big old arena. They come on. Most of the crowd are cheering, apart from one member, uh, a couple of booing. Don't get me wrong. And there's one guy at the front who's holding up his middle fingers to the to to Chad Kroger instead of putting them in his ears. And I just. And and they, Nickelback at the end of the song insist, Chad insists that this kid gets thrown out or removed. I'm not sure to give, to be perfectly accurate, I'm not sure what he had in mind. Thrown out or removed. Oh, and if that's a distinction without a difference. What, um, what he did threaten to do was leave the stage unless this happened because the security just were like, what? This isn't our job to throw a kid out. He's not, he's not harming anyone. He's not posing any kind of threat. So he stopped the gig, did he? I don't know. He he threatened to walk off the stage right. unless the kid was removed. He waited till the end of the song before, and I just I just sort of watched all this going down. And it wasn't just me. My friend Paul Harris, who we've just talked about at the start at the top of the show, um, after he'd shot this, came back to me and went, "Fucking hell, did you see that?" And it's like it's my impression of an Essex <laughs> accent, by the way. <laughs> Fucking, did you see that? And I said, "Yeah." So it wasn't just me that thought, "Well, that was peculiar." And I, ju- I just, it just provided me with the intro for this piece. And I just wrote for, you know, for anyone described what had happened. And I said, for anyone not employed by or in love with Nickelback, the message is clear. New sentence, Chad Kroger, colon, what a cunt. <laughs> and then, and then, and then a break between that. So, so, so it's between, right there. Between jumping that and out the, the page. second, between that and the second section. So it just hangs there. And yeah. you can say the C word in print, can you? Yeah. 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 Well, and this is the thing, if, 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 if would I write that today? Probably not. No, I probably wouldn't show but in that way. I was quite a yappy little writer <laughs> back then. I suppose it, I, I would defend it for one reason in that... It was playful as opposed to no, attacking. I, you, or was it attacking? I went on from to... From your, your went, place, I, what I, place were you coming I from? I went on to attack the band, I think, substantively as to the best of my ability <laughs> at the time. Later, that was just me having fun, I think. But what it what it did is, I remember writing it, thinking, "Well, they're not they're not going to print that. They're not going to run with that." And oh, so you just chanced it. You weren't certain that they would. I, I was certain they wouldn't. Right, and they did. So <laughs> that's you know, if if anybody that wants to do this for any for a living or just for the fun of it, don't censor yourself. Wait Give it a go. T- wait till someone else says change that. Don't assume that you're not going to get away with something. Chances are you're not, but you never know. And that was the case that you never know. And anyway, the upshot of all this is that Chad challenged me to, uh, not pleased by what I'd written, Chad challenged me to a boxing match from the stage, uh, by name, from the stage at every arena in their in their UK tour of every single I, city, every I think, town, I, every single city, yeah, uh, and um, and I said, yeah, sure. Were you at any of these shows, or no, did you just hear no, it? You were no, hearing I, it on the grapevine. I heard the next morning. In fact, when they played Wembley Arena, I went to see with my friend Dan. When I went to see West Ham play, uh, so it wasn't until the next morning, even that I found out all of this stuff. <laughs> and you know, Kerrang were <laughs> Kerrang were scouting out locations that this might happen. I learnt. If anybody wants to put on a boxing match, you actually don't need a license. You just need a doctor there on hand in case, you know, I get... You so know. you were fully intending to go through with it. You were up for it. I'm not sure I was fully intending <laughs> to go through with it. Uh, I said that I would and I would have done it had it come to it. 
when nothing came of it, I didn't go by, well, when's this happening? What's <laughs> going on? I'm really keen to get this going. I was quite happy to let it die a sad and lonely death. But just for the record, I said I would fight him. God, oh God, I hope I'm not digging this up now. <laughs> uh, I, I said I would fight him. The ball remained in his cor- or in his corner. I'm really mixing my sporting metaphors here, Matt. <laughs> and uh, and nothing came of it. So other than you know a lot of uh, hype, and, uh, yeah, and perhaps attention, yeah, yeah, and it sort of which is maybe helped a little bit along the way a, a little bit uh, <laughs> a little bit it took a little while to get rid of the reputation of that's all that I did yeah Just yeah going yeah around yeah. the world insulting people yeah 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 um, but that is sometimes part of what I do so I, you know I'll take it love it well mate so good to see you thank you Matt thank you thanks everyone thank and, you for um, coming around it's Matt's birthday today as well birthday everybody today. Uh, all the threes all the threes the big so, three three that you said isn't that big and it, it's it isn't, not that really. big not, not, not when I'm about to send the big four eight <laughs> uh, I just want to say the book is out now it's called Smash uh, and if you like Green Day Offspring Bad Religion No Effects Rancid etc um, you definitely need to buy it I've brought mine can you sign it yeah, of course I can my Ian, pleasure uh, you take care I'll see you in Birmingham with Frank for the book tour that he's going to be putting on Next and um, you've also got a Metallica or well, two Metallica books out as well if people want to read those uh, I do I've written with, written with my friend uh, Paul Brannigan the first one's titled Birth School called Metallica Death and the second one's titled uh, Into the Black and they're uh, published by Faber and Faber much to my surprise published by Faber and Faber truth be told this only the second one's worth buying there you go an honest mm-hmm. man and what's next for you I have no idea other than this John Lydon article no, oh, this John Lydon article <laughs> maybe something about mental health yeah okay yeah. A, f- a full book uh, yeah but it's I'm putting together a proposal at the moment great so ask me in a month alright mate okay. well all the best and um, yeah good to see you thank you everyone Gotta keep them separated.